All right, Gareth, let's get straight into it. Let's talk about uh, the big fight at the weekend. I say the big fight. It's always, I guess, big fight because of who was fighting. Tyson Fury, the number one heavyweight on the planet. I think we all had reservations when this fight with Derek Chisora was not even made, but even spoken about. I feel like you were the man right in the middle of it when they both came sort of face to face in Manchester. When it happened, I feel like everyone's fears came true, right? It was a one-sided, I thought, one-sided beatdown. I even thought Tyson Fury held back could have gone through the gears and decided not to. And in the end, Victor Lachlan said enough was enough and stopped the fight in the 10th round when I felt maybe Don Charles should have thrown in the towel or at least maybe given Chisora a barrage of words about having to do something or the fight's going to be stopped. You were there. You were ringside. You were watching the action for TalkSport. What did you make of it all? Well, I mean, you cover a lot of the points there. What I'll add to that, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, what I'll add to that is uh, I think... Don Charles should have pulled him out, uh, mm. but they can't with Derek because he wouldn't have accepted it from them. Um, but because they know him. And the thing is with Derek, he was beaten after three rounds. He was beaten after six rounds. He was finished after eight rounds. Um, you know, he, every time he was cuffed with a left hook, um, he, he had wobbly legs up to round three. He had a bit of success in the first couple of rounds, but he's dominated every round by Tyson Fury, who nullified all his work up close, never yeah. allowed Derek onto his chest, really. Um, and from the mid-range, just absolutely dominated and battered Derek. It was a slow roasting over 10 rounds. The corner should have thrown the towel in in the eighth. Victor Lachlan, as you say, was merciful in the 10th to make that decision. Uh, Derek was spitting out go gobules, yeah, globules yeah. of blood. Um, Tyson Fury did hold back. His father, John, thought he did when I interviewed him post-fight as well uh, for TalkSport Fight Night. Of course, we were there, as you say. Um, and I think wrapped up in all of that, we didn't get the Tyson Fury song afterwards. It was pretty cold. But Tyson was quite concerned about Derek Chisora afterwards. So mm. was he too with two competitors standing in that neutral corner. I was right behind Tyson Fury while he was doing that, by the way. I was already in there. For interviews, I wondered if it was going to kick off at one point. But the great thing is, we got the call out of Joe Joyce and Alexander Usyk on the same night in the same corner. Twenty twenty three is set up. I want to talk about Anthony Joshua later as well, because where the devil was he? Yes, it was a, the rival promotion, and I'm going to talk to you about last week and Dillian White and and Anthony Joshua's as well this week, because. Yes, we're talking about him, but he's invisible at the moment. <coughs> Absolutely invisible. It was a big night. Tyson Fury, it's extraordinary. I spoke to Bob Arum. It's extraordinary to get 60,000 people in a stadium in, in midwinter, outdoors, to see a boxing match. It was a, it was a very interesting night. Um, yes, the worst fears came through. Derek Chisora didn't really give Tyson Fury... Uh, uh, the biggest challenge, and, and then I think Tyson Fury rightly put, he encapsulated it by saying, I got 10 good rounds in then. But it was like him sparring against the heavy bag with respect to Derek Chisora when I say that. Yeah, look, and we're going to talk more about uh, Fury and Chisora and what next for them. And I, I agree with your point about AJ. I've agreed with several of your points about Anthony Joshua. Um, I thought initially he wasn't in the country. He was in the country. And if not for the fact that all the best heavyweights were there, Joe Joyce was there, Usyk was there, Fury was there, just be there for Chisora. He's a good friend. He was there for you in Saudi Arabia when he fought Alexander Usyk. He's part of 258 Management, which is your company, right? So, or you at least have the majority share of that company. Be there for that. So, yeah, look, disappointed that Anthony Joshua wasn't there, but we're going to unpack everything a bit later. Uh, Daniel Dubois uh, survived a big scare against Kevin Lorena. It's funny, when I was watching it at home, and you, you obviously had a better view than me being ring sub, when I was watching it at home, I was like, okay, look, obviously something went wrong with his leg. And I didn't want to give Lorena any credit. And then I saw the punch which landed on the top of Daniel Dubois' head, which obviously messed with his equilibrium and, it, in a sense, inflicted the damage. I was like, you know, Daniel Dubois got away with one there, big time. Um, he had to kind of had to dig deep and find out about himself and fight injured. And in the end, he got the job done. But I think that has now showed that maybe you kind of pause the brakes a little bit or am I being a bit too harsh on Dubois? Yeah, I think you're being too harsh. I thought you handled it very well. He clearly, he's a big, big man, remember, and he's still very young, and he suddenly felt his leg go. All his power comes through that back leg, remember, with that right hand that he throws. No, I think it's a genuine injury. Um, mm. We should know more about it this week. He was going straight off for the x-ray 
And we'll hear that later from Shane McGuigan, who I was on the ring apron with both of them, with his trainer Shane himself. No, I think you could see the absolute worry etched on his face when he went down three times in a round. WBA rules, by the way, let's clarify this. Don't apply under British Boxing Board of Control three times down in a round. Uh, It doesn't end the fight he got away with that one definitely that's a, that, that's nonsense that is as well by the way I mean it's yeah. the rule don't get me wrong and I, I I get it but again we always talk about trying to bring casual fans into the sport and trying to explain that to a casual fan okay this is the WBA regular heavyweight belt their rules don't apply even though he's showing the belt because it's in a British ring and the British Boxing Board of Controls rules over override the W it's just so ridiculous but in the end, look, it didn't matter because he got the job done. But sorry to cut across you, Gareth. I just felt like that rule was ridiculous. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, but it's um, boxing's riddled with anomalies. We know that. Mm. You know, I've, I've just had lunch the, this afternoon. Uh, Thanks for the invite. With, uh, no, with, with Mauricio Suleiman. He invited mm. me. I, I, I had a long chat with him about different rules and regs, um, things that we can talk about um, as we wrap up the year. I'm saving it for that. Um, yeah. talked to him about it and he said look um, there's so many weird things going on in boxing um, you know not least uh, uh, you know Olympic non-inclusion in 2028 all kinds of stuff but I think I think Daniel Dubois kept his head in there um, and so did Shane McGuigan I just I think he did a good job there I think he he he, he kept on top of himself he waited patiently um, it clearly was yeah, yes, his equilibrium might have gone slightly as well by that punch on the top of the head by uh, left-handed Kevin Lorena, who doesn't look like a big heavyweight at all, by the way. Um, at all. And, and, and he got through it. Um, but, but there were worries there that he wasn't even going to be able to stand up. And in fact, I wondered after the second round whether they were actually just going to withdraw him. But it was good that he managed to get through it. Absolutely good. Uh, brilliant that he managed to get through it. And also... Just find that moment where he was able to hurt Lorena and stop him. Yeah, I, I you know, obviously look at it differently. And I, I feel like um, he was lucky that he was in there against someone in Lorena who wasn't this sort of wild dog. Because a lot of other heavyweights, as soon as you smell blood and you see Daniel Dubois go down three times, you jump on him. And for some reason, Kevin Lorena, obviously looked not a heavyweight, is a blown up cruiserweight, just didn't seem to want to go for it. Didn't seem to trust that he wouldn't get caught with something and in the end obviously look Danny Dubois gets the victory and moves on look again we're going to discuss all that Tottenham card and what next for both but I want to quickly touch on uh, Josh Kelly fantastic performance in the northeast against Troy Williamson winning the the British super welterweight title I initially thought that you know Josh Kelly would start well and then Troy Williamson would sort of rein him in and reel him in and sort of maybe get a late stoppage in the end Josh Kelly showed why everyone was so hyped about him a few years ago because he won every round. It was a complete shutout. I was scoring the fight. I was watching it. And I scored every single round to Josh Kelly. That Josh Kelly, um, once he gets into a rhythm like that, he found his rhythm. I think once he gets into a rhythm like that, he's world class. Now, mm. is Troy Williamson world class? Probably not. So yeah. we need to see Josh go through the levels now. But it's a great, I would say, recovery of where we were all seeing him in his career. Adam Booth, has said for so long how talented this kid is. And uh, he's not a kid anymore, but it, it was a massive statement from Josh Kelly, especially, as you say, as the rounds went on, he just got better and better and better. Bull and the yeah. Matador, and and frankly, the Matador was magnificent, Eddie. No, he, he really was. Where's he ceiling, Gareth? I mean... Look, he was big for 147, but as always, when a guy is big for a weight class, doesn't mean he's going to be big for the weight class above. And he looks like a small 154. You think of some of the best 154 pounders in the world, and they're all very, very big. Where's he seeding? Is it world level? Do you see what he can do with some of the best in the world, the fringe guys? What do you do with him? Well, I think let's see what happens with uh, uh, Liam Smith and yeah, Chris Eubank Jr. at very middleweight. Yeah. Liam Smith is a great opponent at light middleweight for him. I think Liam can still make light middleweight, as I call it, super welterweight. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but then, you know, Jamel Charlo being the undisputed champion, I mean, he's calling out uh, Arta Viterbiev at the moment. Uh, he's calling out um, Dimitri Bivol at the moment, a light heavyweight, remember, saying, have a little tickle with me. Um, you know, they talk about Charlo as someone that Canelo could fight as well, because Charlo, Charlo's an enormous light middleweight, isn't he? Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, I think um, Jack Kulke is an opponent. I'd like to see, me in against, yeah. see him in yeah. against um, Brian Castano. Um, there's a few guys out there who he could test himself against. Uh, Danny Garcia uh, is, is at light middle now as well. That's a good test. But, you know, at the moment... And then, and then there's some of the British guys as well. There's some of the British guys that are still floating around. I know Ted Cheeseman's going to come back. Yeah. So Megantons around there. So just fun fights at British level yeah. to maybe win that belt outright and then go. So he definitely has uh, big options to Josh yeah. Kelly. Again, we'll talk about him a bit later. Very quickly on this one, if we can, Gareth, obviously the big fight in America over the weekend, live on the zone, the trilogy between Juan and Francisco Estrada and Chocolatito. Um, I thought Chocolatito was going to get the job done. He didn't. I watched the fight back. I scored it for Estrada as well, 116-112. It ends that trilogy. For Chocolatito at 35, do you think that's it? Or do you think there's still a few more big fights? Estrada will have big ones left, but do you think that's it for Chocolatito? Traditionally, that weight division posts 33, 34, 35. You, you're not going to go on. Yeah. Um, uh, he's not the same unbeatable jack-in-the-box he once was. Mm -hmm. um, and that showed, I think, uh, on Saturday night. He's still an amazing boxer. Four weights, isn't it? Four weights. Yeah, it is four. So um, he's found his limit. Um, Estrada, I thought, was phenomenal. I thought it was, uh, for me, it was uh, 115, um, 113. Um, I, I, for some reason, I scored it that for Estrada. Um, yeah, fair. Chocolatito is someone who um, may go on. I, I, it, it, it depends on his appetite for who he wants to fight and who's out there. Um, you know, the, back in his homeland, he, you know, he, he's got wealth and fame and all those kind of things. He's going to have to think long and hard about uh, about carrying on. I mean, you know, because at some point he's going to decide that he walks away. And, you know, he that we might get a quadrilogy from these two. You never know. Um, is that what it's called, a quadrilogy? I've never heard uh, that well, before. Is that, is that what it is? Well, that's what it's I made call up, it. Didn't you? Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, it's made up. But yeah, it, it, yeah. Sounds quadrilogy, right. <laughs> quadrilogy, quintrilogy, sextrilogy, septrilogy, octrilogy, non-trilogy, and docker, dicker, docker, dilla, 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 whatever it is. Ten of them. But. <laughs>